Hi, I'm Clark Ridgway, Professor Emeritus of the School of Pharmacy at West Virginia University, and we are here in the Cook Heyman Pharmacy Museum, a room that has been dedicated to replicate a pharmacy that would have been in existence from approximately the American Civil War on up through about World War II. The artifacts in here are priceless. Uh, some of them date as long ago as the 1600s. We have a full collection of uh, crude drug products and the implements that pharmacists would have used to make their products from scratch. These books represent pharmacopoeia. These were the original recipe books that pharmacists would have used uh, to create their various drug products. The one in the center is from the 1764. It is a London pharmacopoeia. It is the oldest text that we have in our library. This text is an American pharmacopoeia or U.S. pharmacopoeia and what makes it distinct is the Americans were the first ones to translate from medical Latin into English. This is a pharmacist's uh, recipe book or formulary that uh, they would have used to compound their own products for sale. Uh, some of them were medicines and some of them were used uh, for household purposes. Uh, this dates from 1860 from Charlestown, Virginia before we became a state. A uh, camphorated tincture of opium was a product that was used really up until about the last 30 years. Uh, for a whole host of treatments in the household. It was rubbed on the chest, it was taken internally, and uh, it would cure a number of different ailments. Tincture of Digitalis is a product that is still currently uh, used today, although in its more refined form of the product called Digoxin. Caryophilus also goes by the common name of clove, and it's not used only as an herb in cooking, but it was also excellent for uh, eliminating uh, dental pain. The oldest piece that we have in the museum is this bell, mortar, and pestle. It dates from 1648 uh, from the Netherlands, and this device would have been used to reduce a crude drug from its bulk root or nut or leaf form into a powder. Now these were used as a form of advertisement. Uh, the different layers would be filled with different colors of liquid, usually water or water and alcohol combination. They would then put a light source behind uh, the object and place it in the store window. So at night it, the light would shine through the colored water, much like a neon lighting does today. All of these instruments here were used to reduce crude drug from its bulk form into a powder form that could then be mixed into a final dose that would be given to the patient. Over on the far right we have a drug mill that was used to grind up large pieces. It might have been um, rocks, uh, it might have been very hard roots or pieces of bark. These represent, uh, this represents the working area of the pharmacy. This would have been out of sight of the public where the pharmacist compounded their prescriptions in, in private and so you would have had smaller containers of chemicals and crude drugs that the pharmacist needed to make up the pills and powders and liquids that were then dispensed to the patient. Pharmacists would sell them an ounce, a half ounce and people would make their own herbal teas at home. The, the two large objects hanging to the right are called prescription worms. They were actually a way to file prescriptions uh, when you had to keep them physically uh, on hand for readily ready retrieval. And we have prescriptions from the 1800s sporadically on up through the 1940s. In front of us are examples of two patent medicines. Patent medicines were sold to the general public without a prescription before the 1906 Pure Food Drug Act. Uh, people could put anything they wanted to in the product and put any claims that they wanted to make on the label without restriction. Uh, these two products represent the fact that Dr. A.C. Daniels, uh, Dr. Daniels may or may not have been a doctor, oftentimes people called themselves doctors to boost the sales of their products. The St. Jacob's oil represents a product that was advertised in a number of different languages to meet the needs of the large immigrant market uh, in this country in the late 1800s. This particular product is called the miner's friend, but when you look at the ingredients it could have been anything but a friend to the miner. It was a combination of very strong laxatives 
and the last thing I would want to take before I had to get down and spend 8 or 12 hours in the pits was a very strong laxative.